Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Intermediate Digital Painting. I'm going to start a lecture right here. And what we're going to do is, first thing I wanted to do is in the last class, we talked a little bit about artificial light sources compared to natural light sources. And what I wanted to do is just quickly go, out, just go over a couple key terms that all of you should know and you should have learned from basic drawing. But I thought I'd cover them here really quick. So what I've done is if you get a chance and you go over and you check out our blog, Okay, and if we pull this up here, and let me hit escape and go back to where we were. If you come back down here, I put up a couple samples of four images I found of artificial light sources, okay? Um, and actually, they're not all artificial. Two of these are candle. This one is actually a natural light source, so I should change it from artificial to just soft light lighting conditions, okay? So this is being lit by light that's coming from outside a window. And then this right here, this is most likely artificial light source because it's on a backdrop which means it's a like a curved backdrop a photo backdrop and there's probably really soft lighting coming from one direction and actually I could sort of tell by looking at it there's probably two light sources in this and that's pretty common because when you're lighting um, in a condition like this you have two to three light sources and we'll talk about how this type of lighting works this is actually really similar to how we use lighting inside Maya. Even though this is not a Maya class, basic lighting, we have a key light, we have a bounce light, and we have a fill light, okay? And not fill like me fill, but the other type of fill, okay, that comes back and fills uh, long part of the side there. So we'll, I wanna talk about that in just a second, but also what we're gonna talk about in this lecture as well is we're gonna jump into this next assignment, which is basically gonna be an alleyway. Okay, so I put some alleyway reference up here for you. And what we're going to do is we're going to start off painting an alleyway, okay, from one light source being an artificial light that's going to be casting downward. So what I did is back down here, I went and I grabbed a couple layout designs that were from um, a, a, a movie that I worked on. This is the Adam Sandler movie, The Eight Crazy Nights. And then I'd happen to have the layout pack from when I worked on it, so I put these... I grab these from the layout pack and I put them up here, okay? So the, here's the downside and the negative side. If you can't, you're supposed to have drawing ability coming into this class, okay? If you're one of those people that lacks some of that drawing ability, I want you to still learn how tone works in painting. You could come in here and you could use this layout drawing here, all right? The downside is, is if you use this layout drawing and you have this beautiful tonal study of an alleyway at night, you put it in your portfolio, you're going to have to give credit that the drawing is not yours. And if and the drawing isn't necessarily mine either. I worked on in a department where we had numerous layout artists. Sometimes I would do a rough on a design. Sometimes I would get somebody to design and clean part of it up. Uh, sometimes someone does the rough and somebody does the cleanup of the line on top of the rough, okay? so. These drawings, you might want to put, if you were to put this in your portfolio, you would definitely have to list it as, I did not do the drawing, or drawing came from Eight Crazy Nights, or from my instructor, and he provided the drawing, right? And I gave this little scenario before. The reason why this is important, if you look at both of these drawings right here, one is like an alleyway loading dock with lights up here in the right corner, and the other one is this. Um, if you were to submit, this is what a small world it is, if you submitted your portfolio to Warner Brothers, the, one of the guys that was head of our layout department, his name is Chris Ariotis, and Chris is over at Warner Brothers, and he's one of the head designers on all the Scooby-Doo DVDs. So if you submitted a portfolio, even though I worked on this project, I don't know, 13 years, 15 years ago, he would see this and he'd immediately go, hey, that's one of our drawings from Eight Crazy Nights. You didn't work on Eight Crazy Nights. How'd you get that drawing? That's why you always want to have something labeled in your portfolio the drawing provided by class instructor or something like that, okay? Or what you could do, which I would advise, is you could take this drawing right here, you could bring it up into Photoshop or Sketchbook Pro, and you could draw it and then change some of it. You can draw on top of it. You could drop this opacity down to like 40, and in an hour of your time, you can draw the building, and then maybe you change the building to being sort of a steel plate. Maybe instead of a truck being there, you take off the back of the bed and make it just a flatbed truck, right? You could manipulate drawings sometimes, and I'm not saying to copy it to the T. I'm saying to, 
to go over it and change the drawing to make it look different. You can use the perspective that's already figured out there and then you can modify it. So for example, if I was going to modify this drawing, perhaps I might come over here and I might make that a flatbed truck. Perhaps I'd come over here and I might put signage on the front. Maybe I keep all the buildings here, but then in the very back I put a couple skyscrapers. And then I might take out these metal cans, these like oil cans right here in the very foreground. Maybe I take those out and just put boxes, gray bo I mean, just normal cardboard boxes. Maybe I take the pallet out right here, this pallet, and put a stack of other boxes, and then I might just leave it the way that it is. If I change the drawing 80% and it's totally different, and I'm just using the perspective there to guide me along, th that's okay. Not that I want you to do that on a regular basis. Eventually, you need to learn how to draw yourself. But for this class, I can't always sit down and provide you with drawings all the time. You're supposed to come in with part of that knowledge. I did, however, when I was at home, I have an old box and I looked through and I grabbed a bunch of drawings from some shows that I've worked on. So as we go proceed forward in this class on some other assignments, if you guys aren't doing your own drawings, I have some other layout sketches here from some various shows that you could use that could be of convenience for you. Okay. All right, so first thing I want to do, anyway, that information's up there. It's on the blog. If I mistyped anything, let me know. I did it late last night, gathering effort, um, information. So first thing I want to do is I want to talk about some basics of light and what's happening and what you guys are looking at here. Okay, so this is just a little bit of a reminder because every now and then I have some students that have had classes and they forget some of the information that they were learning, and I want to go over it again with you guys, okay? All right, so first thing that I want to talk about is let's take a look at the shadows that are casting here. The shadows that are casting inside the scene are going to dictate the direction in which the light is coming. So if I look right here, I'm going to come over and just draw on top of this. I can see a shadow is casting in that direction. And then over here, what's funny is it's sort of going the same direction, but there's also another light source in there, which is creating sort of a dual shadow. Do you see that in there? Let me command Z and go back a couple steps. Okay, so there are sort of perhaps two light sources, and that's pretty common from a top view. What happens, so imagine if we were setting up a photo to shoot, we're going to have a piece of paper that's like this. There's a, like a light bend in it here, so from a side view, it'll look like this. Okay, and then they have the prop set up right here. And then what they do is they end up having perhaps you know, one dedicated light that's going to be coming, hitting, and then they might have a secondary light, okay, and sometimes they even have a third light, which is a light that might be up above or in the back here, okay. One light is the key light, okay. One light acts as a, sometimes some people call it a fill light, or it could be a bounce light, and the other light is for reflective surfaces. So the other light allows light to come back, and that's what establishes this little bit of reflective highlight coming off of the back right here. Okay, so that could be one approach. Now, if I come back here and erase some of this, since I didn't take the photo, depending on your photo arrangement, I've seen some people take photos with just like a great light system, and they have these wonderful little light shutters around the side of it. And what that's doing is one light source is coming in and then it's bouncing around on here and then it's able to come in here and that's just nice effective lighting. But what's important for us as we're rendering our objects and we get into start painting and tone, we need to be really consistent of thinking about where is the light hitting, what's my key facade. So looking at this box right here, viewable to this angle, I have three facades that I could see. Okay, I have one, I have two, and I have three here. So I know that if I were to draw a three-dimensional light arrow, I know my light is coming in at about this direction right here. Okay, because facade number one is the brightest facade. Facade number two now is the second, is getting darker. Okay, and then when I go over to number three here, Number three is much darker, and then I have the back, the shadow side, okay? So if I were to draw through my shape, and if I was able to spin around and look and see the, the fourth facade, which is this back facade right here, 
that would be a lot darker because there's even less light that's hitting it, okay? So what's really important about this to me, this is probably one of the most important things to think about when we're talking about lighting, is to have an understanding of what the facade planes, planes are. Some people refer to them as planal changes. There's nothing wrong with using that term as well. It's the same thing. So what I think of a facet or a facade to an object, I can also think of it as, I like to think of it as a plane sometimes because there are planal changes that are happening on objects, every object. Even an object that is round, it might not have a hard edge plane, but there is a change that's happening. So if I come back in here and I look at this, it's important because I will, I will go over these numbers with you. I'll make a comment that, hey, that should be number one. The other side should be number two. It's how you establish the render and understand how the light's working. So on here, with my light arrow being in this direction, this is a great way to sort of dissect lighting and take a look at what's happening here. I can tell that my brightest part of the sphere is sort of right up in here, you know, even sort of continuing down into here. It starts to lightly gradate back. And when I say gradate, the, one of the words I could also use is, is degradation. The light starts to degrade, and as the light wraps back around here, I start to get sort of a core shadow that's coming in right here. Now, you'll notice the core shadow doesn't quite dip down, down in here. That's what makes me think and believe that this light source is pitched a little bit lower. So if you could see my hand, if I were to draw it from a side view like this, or actually back up there that if here's the table, here's the sphere, oops, sorry my pen slipped, here's the cylinder and here's the, key, uh, the, the little jewelry box back here, I'm thinking the light's not coming down at an angle like this because I would have more of a core shadow right in here. The light is probably being pitched at more of an angle like this because what it's doing is the light is bouncing up off the table and it's coming right back up in here into the sphere. Do you see that? And that's happening because I know the core shadow is right up there on the top. Okay, so give me a second. So this is what I really like about, you know, I want to keep my light arrow there, light arrow. We'll talk about light arrows a little bit later. They're a really important part of understanding lighting and how tone works. Okay, they're directional arrows that I draw on 3D. Because if light, let's say, was coming from another angle from behind it, I could get in here and I could do this. And I could indicate exactly the direction of that light. And that right there is going to be a different angle than if I did this. See what I'm getting at? That's much more of a tilt, and that's much more coming in at an angle. You know, there's a, a degree change there in the light, okay? That's going to be really important for the beginning when you guys are starting to figure out your, your tone, your value systems, and how things work is understanding the direction of light and how it's hitting. So what's happening right now is I have light that's coming into this, and a lot of you know this already, but just bear with me. The light's coming down, and I'm getting key highlights, okay? So pretty much right here to right in here is a key highlight. Right here, that's a great surface. All of this right in here is pretty well lit, okay? And then it starts to, to there's degradation that takes place, and then you can see that as it wraps around, and there's two things that are conveying that to us. One is the shadow that's coming in here, okay? Actually, three things. Second is the light itself getting lighter, and third is the texture. Do you see the texture? Let me zoom in there. There's a texture taking place on the foam ball itself. Do you see that? And so that texture is actually picking up little highlights in here. See, it's picking up light highlights, but then the surface is getting darker as it's receding. So that's a great example right there is looking at how the texture of the object is also going to display the transition of light that's wrapping around it, okay? All right, and then of course, once I come down here, this is what I call a diffused shadow. It's not a distinctive hard edge shadow. It's very diffused and it blends naturally right off and then fades off, okay? But if I come over here, you see how that shadow is a little bit crisper? Since that shadow is a little bit crisper, I know that this light arrow is probably a little bit closer over towards that cylinder shape, okay? Because that's a nice crisp shadow versus this is also very diffused. But there's something else that could create that diffused look inside that image, and that's this. It's the reflective light. 
light hits a surface and it always bounces back. So right now, if I have light that's coming down in here, okay, so let me just imagine light is coming at this angle. Or you know what? Let me do this, actually. Let me delete my light arrow in here. And let's just forsake, say, oops, hold on. What did I just do? Why is it doing the Maya thing again? Hold on a minute. Escape. That is so weird. Oh, that's a marker. Oops. That's a stupid marker thing inside. Uh, okay, my bad. My bad. I hit a button by accident. I don't know what happened there. Okay, so here, let me come back to Photoshop. Do you select? Okay, so let's say the light's coming down in this direction right now. The reason why we have this hard edge here versus we don't have it over here is this surface completely hits the ground. If I draw through that shape right now, that's completely touching the ground. And then right behind that surface, I have another flat plane of a box. There's not much room for light to get in there, is there? And because of that, it's going to get much darker in there. The values are going to increase. That's the same principle. I can do that in any light source with my hand and my fist. If I take my fist and I take a, my flat palm and I bring it close up and I put it right behind, once I get right in front of my fist like that, I get a shadow that's casting right there. And part of the reason is, is I don't have any light rays that can bounce back and forth in there. However, however on the sphere, the only this part of the sphere is touching the table. And because of that, light is able to come back down, hit here, and it's able to bounce back up off of that surface and even come back into here like this. Light is bouncing around all over the place. In fact, sometimes light even might, might be coming down and hitting that plane and then bouncing back here and then bouncing back. And that's why when I look at this, that is diffused right there. Okay, because it has less surface contact right now. Light is coming back and bouncing back in there. And some of that light is also hitting right in here. And I have a little bit of reflective light coming along that edge. And now the shadow is getting diffused. So now we're using some terminology that I haven't quite, we talked about briefly the other day in this lecture, which is we've talked about light source, degradation, about shadows becoming diffused. We've talked about reflective light. Okay, we're talking about surface contact, understanding what part of an object touches the surface. So here's something to think about, right? If I have, in one of those, those layouts I'm going to give you, there's a truck that's hitting the ground. What happens if I take my hand and take my other hand and come and drop it right over it and raise it just to about an inch above it? I have a cast shadow for my hand on there, right? Versus if I have a pillar, which might be one of those oil containers, Okay, that's going to cast a shadow, but it's on the surface versus the truck being elevated over the surface is going to create a, la a large cast shadow on top of the surface, right? There's going to be changes depending upon contact of how one object touches the other, okay? So these are the little things that I look for. Whenever I look at these pictures, a great little thing that you can ask yourself is where are my areas of read? Where's my one, two, three? Because that's part of the illusion that you're going to be doing when you're creating shapes and you're rendering. Is that you're going to pick a, a facade side of an object and call that one. You'll pick another side and call that two and one will be three. And once you immediately establish one, two, three, you immediately have a change of form. And that is one of the keys you have to remember. Because what happens when students start to get into tonal studies is I'll look around and they have one area totally lit up and it's all bright. And then I go, well, what about that other wall? And they're like, well, what about it? Well, there's reflective light that's going to hit that. Even though the light is dulled down in its intensity, you're still going to see changes of one, two, and three happening. We'll get to that in a minute when we look at some other samples. Anyway, I just wanted to cover that. That's a great little soft study there. I can go through to all aspects of this and just say one, two, three. One, two, three, dark side. One, two. And then here it's, you know, this is sort of like a two transitioning up into there. There's three. There's my dark side. I always have those one, two, threes. And I always give this example, right? I come in here. Oops, let me go to straight lasso. This is how you do it really easy in Photoshop, right? Okay. What do I have right there? I just have a local color. But now if I come in here and if I do this, 
And if I select that top, and if I go to levels real quick, and if I lighten that top, okay, and then if I come and I grab the side here, and if I darken that, there's my illusion right there. There's my one, two, three. I've now created a cube. So it's the exact same principle. When you guys are working, one of the first steps we're going to do, I'm going to walk you through this today, is especially with a night scene, we're just going to tone our whole page. We're going to start with like a 40 or 50% gray, and we're going to do a block in. We're going to come into the light source. We're going to start to block in the light source, and then we're going to think about where that light source is casting. And then as we start to cast that, every time that light hits an object, you have to ask yourself one, two, and three. Where are those facade changes? By this little cube I just did in like 10 seconds, right? Where's my light source? It's from above. It's not coming from in front of it. That would totally change, right? Okay, I know that sounds really simple and easy, but I can't begin to tell you how many times students will be doing a, a total study and they're not applying that simple little process right there into the work that they're doing. Okay, so here, let's move across. That's a great little study, by the way. All right, that's an alleyway. Let's let's go over. <coughs> Give me a second here. This is um, this is a nice light study too. I love this with the daylight coming in from the outside. And again, looking at look at the little highlights here. Look at the light hitting in here. You have some reflective light coming up, bouncing up on the top of this right in here. Let me draw it for you. So here, if we look at this and look at how shadows are casting. Our light's pretty much coming in here really sort of soft like this, okay? And then once it gets in here, look at the highlights hitting here, highlight there, highlights right in here, and then I get that degradation, right? It's going The light's going to degrade as it wraps around, and then I have a distinct shadow right in there. I even have a casting shadow that's coming off of that that's hard-edged, but then it diffuses and starts to fade out back here, okay? And then look at here, highlight, highlight, highlight. Okay, light side, light side, and then here's, so that's one, here's my two, there's my three. Okay, so I can go along almost every side of this. So the light's still coming in right at this angle. Here's my one, here's my two, here's my three. Okay, so I can just map it out every time. One, two, three. And a lot of it has to deal with the facade or the plane that's getting exposed to the particular angle that's coming in, okay? All right, so I, I grabbed a couple alleys here. Let me see what I have up here. This was the one I probably liked the most, and the reason why I like this light this the most is because there's only one light on in the scene, and I actually looked around quite a bit. Some of you that are gurus of web searching will probably find more, um, but what I like to, again, just there's only one light in. So I could come in here now and I could figure out exactly how that light is working. Here's my light source. There's the center of it. That is casting out. This is an artificial light source, and it's casting out basically light rays in a radial direction like this. Okay. To figure out where it's going to hit that wall and where it's going to be the brightest, what I have to do is I have to come across to the object come down to the base of the object, find out where the object hits the ground. That is key right there. The object that holds the light source. Now, as I come over and I make a dotted line across, and if I draw a dotted line going down, that's going to be the hottest, one of the hottest points of that light is going to be where it's casting from. Does that make sense? So if my pole ended up here in the foreground, then my highlight should be right here in the middle. Does that make sense? How I figure that out, okay? So that's really important thing, is that first we have to understand, depending on where the light is hanging from, what is its relationship in the environment that it's in to figure out and plot the ground point at which the light's going to start to spread and hit, okay? So there, let me command Z a couple steps, which I didn't, I, sometimes I get caught up in my, these lectures. I don't add a layer when I should, but that's okay. So right now, I know by looking at this, that this area right here, that's like my hot point, right? That's going to be one of my brightest points. Also, a bright point is going to be this area right in here, coming down. And if you look at it, that's why. That light is casting. See, it's hitting right there. 
And if I draw a line for, from this coming down this way, now it's hitting this dumpster, but look where the dumpster falls in perspective. The dumpster is actually behind the pole, right? And since it is behind in distance to where that pole is in the ground, that light that's hitting right here is not going to be as hot as the light that is hitting right here. Okay, why? If I command Z a couple steps here, get rid of my red, right? That's because the dumpster is hitting the ground here to here. The light pole is touching there. The distance from here to where the light pole is touching is about four feet. Because of that distance, the light's going to be hitting the intensity of that highlight hitting the top of that dumpster should be less than where it's hitting the ground. Does that make sense to everybody? Let me get a yes, make sure I'm on the same page. Okay, good. So sometimes, you know, do you guys remember paint by numbers? I could never follow the whole thing through when I was a kid. I get like halfway and I get bored and I just started slopping on paint. But was really, what I liked about paint by numbers, if they did this, would be the approach to labeling the highlight. So again, think of a value scale. You have pure white, which is one, and you have 10, which is black. So if I were to come in here right now, I could start saying, well, this is number one. That's my purest, okay? After that, this is probably like a number two, a number two, a number two, and then about a number two, and then up here, I start to get to a three and maybe a four. Why? Because the light now is going to be bouncing back up here into this. So now we have to look at what I talked about, the Z depth in the last class a little bit, right? The depth from the foreground that recedes all the way back into here. And so what's really cool in this particular image is you can see that light degradation happening as it's coming towards us. We are darker up in here. This right here, if I swab that color, look at what it is. It's pure black. That little section right there is a pure black, almost. Well, it's about a 9.7, let's say, okay? That's fine. But can you see from here how this is, so remember what black was? Hold on, what's, oh, the, I changed to black, I meant to stay in red. There we go. So this is like a 9.7, almost pure black. And then we come over to right here, and it's gonna jump back up. Once I get to about right here, this should be somewhere in this area, should be around a seven to a five in terms of value. And look, this is the great thing about Photoshop and your little color picker right here is here's one, here's 10. If I swab right there, it's actually, that's about a seven, about right here. So once I get a little closer, that's gonna start to go up a little bit more. And it's gonna go up, well, it's going over a little bit to the pure color, but a great way that I can see around that is if I wanted to, well, I could put black over it and do that real quick. Here, let me do that. Or I could just turn the image into a black and white photo. But I like to do this when I'm working anyway in color, is I like to see how my values are working. So I come back down, put this into hue or saturation, there. So now it gives me a much better idea. I've subtracted the color out, and I can turn that layer on and off. So I can see where the light, and I know this anyway, because that light's gonna cast down. It's probably gonna be more of an elliptical shape, and then as it quickly degrades, so right in here, I'm probably gonna have that value. See right there? That's going up to about a 70, and then I'm up to about a 60, sort of going across there. I'm right in the middle, and then that's where I'm up there at like my two. So the light is brightest here, and then it starts to degrade and drop down. And as I move from here, you can see it getting darker, 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 and then keep going down to where it's almost a pure black right there. Okay, That's important right there. That is what I call a gradient. That is a gradation of values happening. A gradient of values are really, really key in determining shape and form that starts to transition. So if you want to do the paint by number thing and think of where's the light hitting, where it's closest to, those are going to be ones. And then where's the secondary going to be? Where's going to be twos and threes? And then how else does it fade off? So what's different in this scene is I had one light source. Because of one light source, the closest area to that light source will probably be the brightest area versus in one of the other examples that I grabbed to show you. Hold on, I gotta remember that's Ali. Is it this one here? So here we have multiple light sources that are receding along the wall. So because of that, we're not gonna have that that 
automatic degradation into black, are we? It's going to be a lot lighter because we have a couple different light sources here. And look, even here on the right, I can't see the light source, but look at what I know already. Oops. Go back to red so you can see it. I already know that there's light casting that way because I can see the highlight. And I know it's casting this way. I know it's casting this way, like so. Okay, so there's my number ones, my number ones. By the time the light gets down here. Now, how come the curve isn't being lit right there? Why is that curve black? Because the light source isn't over far enough to hit that facade plane. Okay, and this is how I can figure that out. Here's the center of the light, right? If I go back to where the wall it's attached, I drop a dotted line down, and I come over. This is stuff we're, we're talking about in the applied perspective class, right? That's why, right there. Okay. If this light source was on an arm and it hung out, the light source was right here. Dot, 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 dot. Bring this to the wall. Bring it down. Drop. And then it would come across. Then that black side of the curve would now be a white highlight because the light has gone over it. So what's important there, before we jump into all this fun with tone, is that we have to stop in the beginning and ask ourselves, how is the light, what is the light, what's the condition of the light, what's the intensity of it, how many light sources are there, and how is it affecting the perspective of the objects involved with the scene? The position of the light is going to affect the rest of the scene. So we need to be able to figure out where the ground plane is. We need to figure out where are objects in relationship to the light source. So, for example, we have this object right here. This object that's hanging up here is a fire escape, right? Um, it's above the light source, but yet we have highlights here, here, and here on there. Okay? Uh, this is a photo, so it might be a little bit hard, but if you look, you see that little reflective light on the bottom there? I will bet money that is probably happening from when this light comes back down here and it's bouncing back up and we're getting that little bit of reflective light. There is another light further in the back here, but what is the chance that that light is creating that highlight? Probably pretty low. Why? Because this light is so far in the back, if I were to find where it hits, it would be affecting light planes way back in here. You see that? That's much further in the background. It's not in my midground. Okay? Does that make sense? If the light was closer to me, I could figure out what wall it's attached to, drop a dotted line, and see where it's hitting the ground plane. That's where everything starts to change right there. Okay? Oh, how'd I do that? Okay, let's try that again. I went to lasso. I just tried to select this. Oh, I'm drawing on one layer again, like a bonehead. Okay, so anyway, that's a good little photo there. Okay, let me close out of those and then we'll start moving over and we'll start working on our demo here. Okay, in just a second. All right. I thought that was a pretty cool drawing because, or a photo, um, look at the, the light source that's in here, right? So you have one, two, three, four, all receding back. And, and then look at the shadow. I mean, this light is so bright right in here that it's casting a shadow inside this, this little inner section up in the foreground. Yes, Kelsey. I have a question. When our alley lights and the neon lights um here, like you know, like some lights will have like that round disc head around the light itself or one of the uh the barrel or something. Uh-huh. I wanna know is can that determine like how much the light is gonna be casting? Well yeah, it, it can make a difference in the light source. because um, there I've seen light bulbs that are like small and square and they're super bright and I've seen some that are round and they're much softer so depending on, on what kind of bulb it might be you know it could and again that's where we come back to the intensity of light there's like numerous factors uh-huh going back in here Okay, so what I liked about this is all the lights going back, there's a lot of values that stay the same, and then you have that nice little front shadow there, okay? Um, and then we come back over here. Um, 
that's just I like that it was just one candle. Look at the power of the one candle being lit and how it's reflecting everywhere. Some of the highlights that are taking place up here on the camera, even the shadows. Look at how crisp the shadows are, like right in here, super crisp. Right here, that's very crisp. You know, just that's one thing I wanted you guys to do was I mentioned for for you know wanted you guys to take some pictures and then we'll take a look at your pictures. So you guys are analyzing light sources yourself, trying to figure out where the one, two, and the three are. A candle is something that most people think doesn't have much power, and it depends on the wick size, of course. But I placed a little, you know, those little candles people float. I, my wife had one of those. I put it in the corner of my studio, and I was blown away how that little soft light hit everything on the far corner, far corner of the studio. And then I took another candle that had a bigger wick, and I lit that thing, and like everything was like super bright. And that's what's cool is looking at what light is doing to the conditions around the room, you know. You get a better idea. And sometimes that only happens from looking at things for a while, you know, and just paying attention to what's around you and, your, um, and seeing how light affects. So here's another example where, again, numerous lights lit in a row, hanging in an alleyway, receding back. And I really liked how just right up here, the, I mean, this just drops into pure black. Look at that. Boom. Right down dead 10 black. And then you come over here go to that center of that white source, you get pure white. So here's a great example of a one to 10 happening and even the degradation of the wall. If I come over here, again, how would I find out? Let's take a look real quick. Let me put a layer, oops, hit okay. Let me hit a look, come back, let me go to red right here. So if I come over here, there's a center of that light, right? It's radial, you can see it radiating and all these different light rays coming out, okay? But look at where that light attaches to here. If I drop a line down to here, where it hits the street, and now I come across the street, okay? I know exactly where that if that, see, I can even figure it out from here. You can figure out how the shadows are casting in this direction from where the center is hitting the ground right here, okay? That's pretty cool that you can figure that out. But with that, I can also take a look and just like, I mean, I know this area right here is going to be much brighter than is this area or this area right here. And I could just see it by looking at it. I can bring up the color picker, and that's a great thing, the, the 1 to 10 in here. Look at that. So look at it. Here was pure white. Here, it's getting a little bit lighter. It's getting even more lighter, more lighter, more. Oh, wait, I might hit a highlight there. And then I get back here, and I'm a lot darker. So just 1, 2, the three are my instant jumps right there. And that's displaying that degradation of light that's happening, okay? So when we start to paint one of the first environments that I'm gonna give you guys, okay? If you wanna draw your own over the weekend, you can, you have that option. Or you can use one of the ones I'm providing you. Um, as you start to paint it, an easy approach that I like to do is I like to just lay down like a 30 or 40% gradation and I block in where my lights are gonna be. And then I come back and then I start to block in some of my shadows. And then the next step is, is sort of like my, like my finished rendering, my final pass, where I get all these little milks and crannies of where the, la where the light is bouncing. I even, what's really cool is that if your tonal study is working really well, you can start to turn off the, the line drawing. The tone will hold the rest of the drawing together. And that is a principle that some of you have not, are just starting to encounter now but as you get into painting, okay, and you get really good at understanding color and tone, you completely lose the line drawing almost. Your values and your tone should completely hold the whole entire piece together. The, the line drawing isn't really needed anymore. It's the same thing with doing really good character design as well. Okay? All right, so with that said and done, um, let me stop the recorder real quick. I've been lecturing for about 35 minutes right now. Let me stop it let it record and then I'll start the demo in just a second. Okay, so let's go ahead. We're going to start working with this. So this is, I, I mentioned this before, I grabbed these two layouts from an old show that I worked on many moons ago. This is from the Adam Sandler um, uh, movie, Eight Crazy Nights, it was an animated feature and um, I happened to have the model pack and I was flipping through it and again, if you're going to use any of this work in here, um, it belonged to Adam Sandler and to Sony features. And so if you use one of these pieces inside your work, 
uh, you need to give credit to the line drawing not being yours, okay? So again, you could draw over this and alter the drawing if you like and make your own. But what I, one of the things I wanna talk about real quick is when you bring a drawing in, you notice how that one is more of a white and that one's a little bit more of a brown. I've noticed that's the scanner that does that sometimes. So a quick way around that is after you scan in the image, if you go to control L levels and you click the little white eyedropper here and you touch the white area, it will automatically make It'll add more white into the piece and it'll, it'll detract any of the lower tones that are there. I find that very helpful because look at the difference between that. And then again, if I go to levels, hit the white, touch it, hit OK, boom, huge difference. Same thing here. If I come back in here, look at that. I go to levels, white, touch it, bam, it's done. I have a nice crisp line drawing to work from, OK? I'm going to work from this drawing right here. And before I start... Um, which is pretty cool is already I have one light source in here for right now later on I could get complicated I could turn on one of these window lights or something right um, I could add a light source coming up from above right in here okay one of the things I wanted to mention is the perspective and what is happening with the objects in here so again this is something I always do whenever I start I always analyze where the light source is I have a light source oops thought I was on another let's go back to red okay so look at where my light source. My light source is right here casting downward. It's an artificial light, and it's going to be casting as a radial light radiating out, okay? And when it probably hits the edge of this right here is where it's going to stop. So one thing that's cool about that is, hold on a minute. Let me see if my ruler's up here. I'm going to have to freehand this. Um, my ruler's gone. That I can pretty much guarantee I can draw a line from where that line's going to hit. And I could come over here and do the same thing from the center. And where I hit right there, okay, I could know that from here up it's going to be darker, right? Because the light is casting from that center point. So and then as the light hits here, what shape is that light, folks? That cut or the, the, the bulb is round, but it's inside an object that is elliptical. Okay, it's an ellipse. Because it's an ellipse, when that light hits here, Imagine part of the ellipse fading off like that. Does that make sense? You could, a great way to figure that out is to take a flashlight and shine a flashlight on the wall. And when you do that, it's a round shape because that light is in centered around a round um, structure. So it's the same thing here with this. So technically, that light's going to hit here on this wall, and then it'll sort of lightly start to cast downward like this, like so. Okay. Depending on the intensity of the light, I might not see any direct change. It might just sort of be very crisp, overlap some of that, and go down like this. And then it would technically hit part of the ground. Now, one thing to remember, where's the brightest area going to be? So if I, come, if I take the light source where it hits the wall, I bring, come down from the wall, and I hit the ground, and I go across, and then draw a dotted line from the center of that light, boom. That right there, folks is the center that should be the brightest part or one of the biggest highlights right there. Now the only thing that might change that could be the condition of the surfaces. So if that concrete was a painted black concrete, and I have snow in this scene, don't I? Do you see the snow right there? Snow's white. If this was a dark surfaced concrete, this would now become my biggest area of contrast or read that white snow would pick up that white light immediately. However, though, you have to remember this. The light is casting and landing right here. Therefore, there might be a shadow coming this way from that curb over part of the snow. Aha. See, these are little things we have to think about. But let's just go around. I like to just go around and just figure out where number ones are going to be. I'm going to have a number one there. I'm going to have a number one there. I might have a little highlight here. This is going to have a number one up in here on that side. It's going to be pretty bright, okay? But then I know from here as it fades off, like I looked at my previous reference, once I get out to here, I might be in like a 10 area right up in here. And then as I drop back down in here, it's going to gradate down to like maybe a 7, but then my light's fading off from like a 1 to maybe a 6. Does that make sense? So it sort of is like paint by numbers, but before I even dive in there, I'm figuring out where my lights are going to be. Now this is a little tricky one. Look at this box right here. This box sticks out with this little mattress in there. So look, the box 
is here. And if I draw a dotted line over, it sticks out past where that light hits. So this box will be dark inside. Okay, this is receding away from the box, coming towards me. So that means this will also be dark as well. Okay, if I could see the box bend up like this, that would be nice and bright and white right there because it is back further and it's in the area of where the light's going to hit there. Okay, so that's what's sort of cool about this piece here is that box is a little bit of not a trick, but you got to examine the perspective of the box and see how it's fitting inside the scene. That's what's really important, okay? But anyway, outside of that, remember, this is radial. So look at this light. As it hits here, light's going to be casting out in these directions as well, going from dark to light. So let's look at another facade that might be hit by some light. So this little lip right here is going to cast a shadow. And if I come over here and I draw a line coming across and hit and plot that point and then plot this point coming down, that shadow might cast that way. And I might have a shadow that might be right here, which would be from that casting this way as that radial light comes across. Okay? But then look at that. So this right here might be like a two or a three in terms of its whiteness. That little lip that's going to be out in the open that's being hit by the light, but look, then look at the surface of this tire. This plane right here, what is this plane on that tire going to be? In, in terms of a number. Yeah, probably like a six, seven, maybe even an eight. And then again, depending on the tire, what if it was a white wall tire? It might be more like a five. What if it's a dirty, black, grungy tire that has tons of dirt on it, now the surface of the tires changed? It might be like an eight or nine. But it's going to be an 8, and I know this side here could be like a 9 to a 10, right? So I know I will see a facade change on that tire from there to there with the light. Even though it's in my foreground, and it's perhaps 5 feet away, that's totally fine. But I can figure that out right now and understand. I know up here on the wall, I might have some bright highlights on that brick right there. And then the motor, mor mortar, not motor, mortar, can't talk today underneath here that might be darker okay and then up here might be a 10 that lightly gradates back down and fades off so before I'm even jumping into painting I am doing a little bit of analyzing with numbers to figure out what's going to be this really helps me out quite a bit look I have reflective windows right here those might be anywhere from a 2 to a 4 look I have a reflective glass cover right there 2 to a 4 I have another window back here. It's much further away, dropping off. Light might be coming down here, bouncing back up at that. That might be anywhere from a seven, you know, six to a nine, depending on the cleanliness of the window. Does that make sense? These are the things I want to analyze and talk to myself about. Because right now, I already have a whole number theory figured out in terms of how I'm going to paint. I know where my brights are going to be. I know where my darks are going to be, OK? All right, so with that said and done, let me delete that layer. Let's dive in and let's just start painting this guy. So the first thing that I like to do, again, let's take this layer. Let's move it up to the top. Okay. I'm going to put that on multiply. So that's my line layer so I can paint underneath it. That way I can erase parts of line or I can d diminish the line as I'm painting. Right now, if I diminish that line, I'm seeing a checkerboard. That's because I have no background layer. So I'm going to select a background layer right in here. And let's just go and fill that with a medium grade tone. Let's just drop down to about a 60% right here. I can come in here and just go boop, and I filled it right there. Okay. And then what I like to do is I like to label all my layers. This might be my very far BG. Okay. Actually, now after looking at that, I'm like, you know, that's still not quite dark for me. I might want to go a little bit darker. Let's go down to like maybe a 70 or 80. That's cool. G, fill it. Deselect. I come back up here. My line layer is on multiply, and I can adjust the opacity of my line layer right now accordingly, like so. Okay? And this is actually a fun part. This is why you want to work on toned paper in your sketchbook. This is why oil painters would draw on a white canvas or gray canvas, and then they brown the canvas. It's a great technique. They brown the canvas because now as I start to work and I start to come in and put little areas of white in there, 
it immediately pops what's happening inside my, my piece and I get a good read as to what's happening. So I'm going to do the rough blocking. Before I do that, I'm going to lock that layer. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to drop my line layer down to about 70, 80%. And then I'm going to lock that layer. Why am I locking it? Because I don't paint on the line layer. If I paint on the line layer, once I drop the opacity, it's affecting the opacity of the, the I don't want to say the color, because we're using white and black, and white and black are tint and shades. It's going to affect the tint and shade that I'm putting down here. Okay. So now what I can come down, let's label this. I like to call this sometimes my HL or my my uh, highlights, or I might just call it light right now. And then I have another area here I call my shadows. This is all I really need right now. Very simple. Do not develop 55 layers. You don't need that right now. Okay, you need to trust in yourself and have that confidence, okay? And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to come in here. I'm going to switch to maybe let's just go to about 20%. I don't like using pure white. I like to start a little bit lighter. I'm going to go into one of my brushes here. Um, I have this one brush, this one called Awesome that I like that's fun. And then I also have this one. I got these from a concept artist named Shadi Sadafi. He's really talented. He put these online. I like these fade-in brushes. They work really nice. So I'm just going to start with this brush right here, go to the layer that I want. And what I do is I just sort of come in here, and I just, boom, there's my light right there. Now as I'm working, I'm always going to be adjusting my brushes by adjusting my numbers. Because right now, if I come in with a, a 10 by having it on 0, I'm just getting pure white right there. I don't want pure white right now. I want to be able to come in at like a 20%, and I knew this light was going to, I might do like a little bit of a cast coming across like this to figure out what's going to be being hit. But then where that hits right here, I know that this is going to be a little bit brighter right here. So I'm at 20%. See, then I can just lightly move the brush down, and I get that effect of a highlight hitting there. Okay, so then I could come across here, and I just quickly go in here now, and I just sort of block in where I know I might have highlights coming. And by doing this, this is immediately going to start to separate out part of the shape and the form of what's happening in my piece. Now, if you want to do this with selections, that's fine. So I could come in here, and if I know the light's hitting here, you want to do this really fast. There's nothing wrong with doing this. Everyone has their own method. So I can come in like that and say, uh, just do this. Light's going to hit here. It's going to cast all right to here. Actually, sorry, I went the wrong way. Like that. I can make that little selection right now. Close it, hit, oops, hit control H to hide my ants. And now when I come in here with my brush really lightly, do you see that? It's just going to pick up along the edge right there. So I know I'm going to have little highlights coming along here. I might have a little highlight coming on this edge. And I basically start to block in little highlights and facades. This box is turned right here. So I know that facade is going to be closer to the light source. This other side will be darker. And then I just keep coming in here and I just keep blocking in and roughing out where I'm imagining my highlights to go. Just, it's a rough in. Uh -oh. So I'm painting right here, nothing's happening. Why is nothing happening? Because I still have my selection on there, right? Sometimes I hit 0, 5, and I go to like 5%, that's really light. So I can get a good idea of how that light's sort of casting. Okay, I'm gonna hit deselect. I got rid of my ants and come across here, start to build this up a little bit more. I'm always pressing my buttons. You know, I'm always going from like two to three. And maybe I have some real distinct highlights coming across, like right here on the corner of that window. I got a highlight popping up there. And I just keep building my piece, thinking about, you know, maybe this light's right above here. So this ground plane right here might be a little bit lighter. Now, if you don't want to do it this way, if you prefer to do it by selections, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm doing it painterly with a brush. That's totally fine. I could also commit to everything and do it on one layer. If you have that confidence, let me show you what I mean. If I take off that lock, and if I were to come in here right now, I could select that layer and go. 
fact, this is an assignment we did in the Photoshop class the last the summer that I added in, and it was really cool. See, I can just lighten it up by going like that. I can select areas. See how a lot of comic book guys paint. They paint by selections and by using gradients. So I just did that. The reason why I don't like to do that, and I like to paint up above, is if I don't like my background right now, which I think it's a little light, I could come in here and just darken it because it's on a separate layer. And then I could even pick little parts of my composition that I want to darken more. If I say, hey, I know in the back there that's the sky, and this is all going to be much darker back in here. Whatever, I can select that. And then I can just go into levels, and boom. I can darken part around that building. See what I'm getting at here? Oops. I'm starting to build everything and create my, my piece to do my light study on, OK? That's a block in right now. Um, I prefer, the way I like to work is when I start off sometimes, I like to keep my shadows on a separate layer and my lights on a separate layer. Do you know why? Because as I'm working, if I make a mistake, I only got three layers, then I can change it. If I commit to one layer, which is fun sometimes to work like that, but if you commit to one entire layer, you have to repaint it. There's no going back in and really adjusting it. Okay. So from here, I'm just going to keep blocking out and I'll keep darkening things. Okay. And it, it, you know, and another way to work, like I said, by selection. If you want to come in here and just select an area like this, and that makes you more comfortable. To just and there, I do this quite often now when I'm painting with rocks and mountains. As I select something like this, I hit H. I know that's going to be darker. So I go into my brush, which is a darker value. I drop it down to about 20. And then I just come along like this. And see, I have the selection holding it together. So I can make a little bit of a gradient happen right there. Or I can come in here. I might go to 1% and just sort of come along the edges and then just sort of paint that in real rough. There, you see how I did that? I do select. I come back in. I might select another little area in here and say, hey, that's going to be a shadow that's going to cast over this object here. That's going to be all in part shadow like that. Hit H, go into brush, and then boom, just sort of knock it out real fast. That was too light, so now I might jump up to like a 30 or 40. Just keep blocking that out. Okay. Deselect. I know my tire up here is going to be much darker, so I could paint on that guy. And see, I'm just starting to block this out. I just keep going and adding into my little details. Uh, I know that wall is probably going to have some shadow on it. Okay. This back side here. But then where light's coming down, it might come over some of that. So, you know, that's, that's okay. That's my shadow. See, it's separate. So now I could come in and decide, you know what, I went too far with that shadow. It's on a different layer. I can erase it because maybe it's dark where that light is. And then, and then it casts a little bit. So maybe I have light that comes down. This is sort of in shadow, and it hits here, and then it casts over like that. That's going to be maybe that dark area right in there. OK. And then I come back to my highlight layer, what I call my lights. And then I could come in here and say, hey, I'm going to have some highlights happening in here. Oops. It's funny, a buddy of mine sort of showed me this technique, and I've been doing it quite a bit, where I like to just select areas like this and then hide the selection because then you're just looking at what you paint. So there, it's hidden now. If I come in with brush, I'm on my highlights. I hit X, I switch to white, and I come in here like it start at 10%. See, I'm lightly going across the tops, and I could sort of pick where I want my highlights to be. See, I'm doing that really fast, sort of painting on top of it. And then if I want to get like, like a real powerful highlight, I can just hit one little corner or edge if I want because I'm using the part of the selection to guide me through. Okay? So then I just keep working from there. You know, I come back in. I might decide, hey, I'm putting these little highlights. Light's going to hit part of those poles and then wrap over and drop off, right? Well, what about there's going to be some darker values on those poles too. So now I could come into my shadow area. And I could take my selection tool here. Let me 
Oops, I missed that. There, and I'm going to hit H. Oops, hit something else by accident. Hit Control H. I hid those. I'm on my shadows, right? I'm going to switch to my darker value, go into like a 30, and it's going to be a little bit darker coming up from here. And then as that wraps around, it's going to degrade a little bit as it gets closer to the front there. A little bit darker there. And it's going to wrap around like that. Okay. And I just keep working from that. I just hit deselect. Now I'm going to come down in here. I might have water. I keep building this up on the ground. You know, this isn't going to be one constant value in here. Right now I'm doing my block in. Once I get my tones working a certain way, I know perhaps in here it might be really dark up in here in the very back where there's no light. It might be really dark and then it sort of gradates and blends forward. Well, you have to, you have to get used to painting that gradation. And one of the ways I paint a gradation is I do it really rough sort of like this. And then I use my color swabber. Oops, if I can get it to come up. Come on. Sorry, I use my hotkeys I'm used to on a Mac. And then I can grab like a little bit lighter and then I can blend that value in and get that blent in. And then I can keep coming in through here. Darkening that value up, getting it to come over. And you just keep painting, just having fun with it. Just keep blocking it out. It's gonna be a little bit darker back in here and then it's going to fade off towards the mattress right in here. The back side of this box is going to be dark. Okay, this is part of the whole blocking stage. Just keep blocking it in. This all might be dark in here. So part of what we do when we paint digitally is we, we block in and then we refine. Okay, so we get our values in there that are working the way that we want. That might even be too dark on a little bit of that, so I can go a little bit lighter and paint over a couple of those and bring them out a little bit. And then I just start working on that tire. I know the back facade is going to be a little bit, especially here, as it's wrapping, it's going to be darker here. And then it's going to start to fade and get a little lighter. And, and then I'm going to have a little bit just hit that front side like that and then where it's in the middle there so let me go back to free lasso here I might be able to just come in here and go select that middle section of the tire okay and I think I already have some values there, so what I can do if I get control H and control L, I can just darken them like that to make the dark parts of the tire so I don't have to paint it in real quick. Hit OK. And I just keep blocking in from here. Look, I want to have I want to have a gradient going from the foreground, receding back in here. And I know sometimes, remember when I did that the drawing in red? I'll come up above like this and I'll remind myself where my shadows are going to hit. So I might come in here and say that my light's hitting here. Hold on, let's not try that again. Deselect there. So my light's coming down here and it might cast out to the wall here and then I might actually have a shadow that's going like this around, maybe up and up here like so. And then maybe part of this light, maybe it wraps here. And then this is all highlight here. And then it comes up and wraps over some of this maybe. Okay, so I get in there and I draw that line to remind myself because once I have that line, I can turn it on and off. So I know up here there's not much light. I can make it go from dark to light now up here in the foreground. So now what I'm going to do is come back to my shadows and go grab one of my airbrush tools. Okay. And I'm just going to grab this darker value that I have in here. And then I'm just going to drop my airbrush down to like 40 and just really softly sort of come in here and just gradate it down, going a little bit darker towards the front like this. Okay. I remember I knew back there that that was going to be a little bit darker in there too. So maybe I'll come in here with my airbrush tool and just sort of say, hey, I might have a darker sky back in here. That building's going to drop off to the back a little bit. 
Okay. And that's it. Now I'm starting to block in. I'm getting the rough part in. That's going to be going from dark to light. Okay. So I'm, I'm starting to get some, some cool feel. I'm starting to separate out where the light's happening. And I just keep going from there. You just don't stop. Come back in. Let's go to brush. I hit X. Swap back to, to white. And I might even just see if I just do this with a soft brush for a little bit. Just thinking about if I have snow down here, there might be some nice little highlights coming up on. Sometimes I don't like the soft brushes because they're too soft. I might have some highlights coming up here. Just fading off. There might be some reflection on part of that water. Okay, might have a little bit of a, a couple little highlights there, something a little brighter there. This wall back here, oops, my hand slipped there. Let's do that again. That's going to be a brighter facade wall. Let me subtract out the, the overlap is right there, right? So I'm still in my highlight. So now I can go to brush. And let's just take a lighter value, see what happens if I just sort of go. That's a little bit too bright. Get that facade change to happen on that wall. Funny, I was too bright, now I'm too light. There we go, that's pretty good. You select it. So that's going to be a little bit lighter. And I just keep working from this. I keep building it up. Change brushes. Go to another brush that you're using. Get it blocked in. There's nothing wrong with making mistakes right now. That's what part of the blocking is. Then you refine it. Okay, the back side of that facade is going to be darker. I go back to my shadows in here. Okay, that light's probably going to be casting a nice little shadow too. So I'm going to imagine this shadow coming this way. Try to go along part of the ground plane that's there. Okay, brush. Okay, so just keep going on it. Try to get those little gradients. I mean, look at in here, dark to light. That's going to be a really important part of blending off back here in that box. It's going to be darker. It's going to come out and get a little bit lighter, you know. I'm always building, going off of it. I haven't addressed anything back here yet, you know. That might be darker. This might be, that could be a little darker on the back side. Maybe part of the wall is, maybe the side of that. Then I could come back in here and start getting a couple little highlights on there as well. Just keep building a little piece at a time. The back side of that box will be a little bit darker. Okay, so then I come back in, I could look back, let's go back to my light, come back, I can take that pure white, go down to like 10%. And if that's getting hit, I might have some reflected light bouncing up on here, on this side of the box. I have that piece of metal that's sort of sticking out. Okay. Might make this a little bit brighter. Start to fade some of that light out. Okay, so see where I'm going? I'm starting to get some mood happening in my scene. And I've only I'm only like 15, 20 minutes into it. I'm just blocking it in. So once I start to get, I'm really starting to like that feel over here in the side, because I have light that's lighter, I have some darks. I could still come in here, blend, get a little bit blended on the tire, a little bit of a highlight, just lightly fading. I might have a little bit of light on this edge here, fading over. See what that's doing? It's getting the tire to pop now. It's getting a little bit of that surface. The inside of that tire, right? What's that going to be? It's going to be black. Uh-oh. 
Don't paint it on the light. Paint it on the shadow. Remember that. That's why you end up merging sometimes is because you end up having... Hold on a minute. Let's put a zero. There we go. Get that dark, and now I can go to five. Fade it out a little bit like that. Okay? So eventually, as I keep building this, I'm going to have, if I go back to my line, I'm going to have reflective light bouncing back, guys. And that's what I'll do at the end. That's more like a finite detail. I don't start by putting in reflective light. No. I start with the blocking. That's part of the refinement stage. So I know when I look at this, look at these little wood boards. Those wood boards, if you've ever seen that planking or you ever grew up in Chicago or Indiana, I'm looking at Donald, right? Because that wood planking is at an angle like this on a house, which means that corner edge right there is going to pick up a highlight, and then the light's going to fade back, and when the next piece of plank goes over it, it's going to be dark right there. Okay? So that's a huge advantage for me to use because I need to think about now, hey, light's going to hit here, and it's going to bounce back up. Oops going to bounce back up in that direction right there. And when that light comes back in there, okay, turn this off. Uh-oh. What did Phil do? You your shadow there. Did I? Okay, let me command Z. There we go. See, I wasn't paying attention. I'm talking. There it goes. So now I could come back in here on my light layer. I'm going to come in and let's just take part of that highlight there. Look, I can come in here and start putting some little bits of reflective light in there. And if I want to be really particular about it, something I've done this before, I've showed some of you guys when it comes to little highlights, right? You can just do this. Do it on a separate layer like this. Watch, I can do it right here. I can just do it in pure white. So I'm going to you hold down the shift button. So I got that really bright right there. I'm going to go down to like two. And you see how I have that right there? That's on a separate layer. So now I could transform it. That's something I was going to show you in the next class. All right, squash it a little bit. See, I could bring that in there right now. And get that like right on that little edge right there. And if it's too bright, that's fine. I can just diminish it a little bit, dropping the opacity. And then I can duplicate that layer. Use the layers to your advantage. There we go. You see that right in there? Now I'm starting to pop those little boards out. And then I got all this milk and cranny detail over here. I got like concrete that has a texture on it. This is just like snow here, but if I want to make that dark, I mean, this is, again, I'm in my, try not to get too far into the, the reflective lights right now. Just try to get a block in. Oops, I hate it when it does that. Let me do it again. That doesn't have to be snow. That could be a pile of horse crap or something, right? Who knows what it is? So I might just come in here and just say, you know what? I don't know what you are. I might draw you in later. I'm just going to make you dark right now and make you a dedicated foreground sort of element like that. But if I wanted to, I could easily say, oh, you're paper? OK, you're going to have little highlights on you like this. Like that and if I come down if I hide those and I go to brush and I swab that white again and I come over to my lights I go down to like 10 see that sort of pop out like that and then if I drop down and start getting some little highlights in there or where that lights coming through just a little bit deselect and then I just come in at like zero five percent and just fade a little in there see now I've turned it into dirt or something but you see where I'm going on this? I'll, I'll continue in the next class. I'll refine it now. I have my block in now. I have a good idea of where my light is, what's happening, and how to proceed with it. But again, everything comes back to that numbers. So part of my next refinement is going to be what I call the pushing and pulling of value for local colors. Okay. That Look at the side of this house here. Do you see this wood here? That wood is, and then that's concrete. I'm going to imagine that wood is painted a darker color and the concrete's lighter. That'll help me because it'll pop my highlights a little bit more. So when I come back in the next class, I'm going to select all this wood area here and I'm going to darken it. And then 
I'm going to imagine in this part right here, the wood trim around the windows is a lighter paint, like a lighter gray. And then I can pop out the white snow and then get the highlights on the window and boom, and then that'll really give some effects to that light. In terms of these little choppy rays and stuff in there in my light right now, that's a little bit later if I want. I could go over and I could really start to smooth out some of my the light that I've chosen there. And some of that's just going to be from you just going really soft at like 5% and is getting in there very lightly. Just sort of blending some and getting rid of some of those lines in there. You could do it. It just takes a little bit of practice. That's a benefit. See if you get a light ray that's too strong. You can also use the smudge tool. And there's a couple other options for that. You know, if I come over here, um, I have some smudge tools I could probably hand out to you guys that I was given. Um, see if I come over here and I drop my smudge tool like to 20%. See how I just did that? It just lightly blends that light and makes it look pretty accurate, right? Or you could just select that area of light that you have and just throw a gradient down there, whatever you want to do. There's a couple of different ways that you can work in here. But for right now, I have something that's starting to work. I haven't dealt with the refinement part yet, which is going to be the reflective light and the bounce light. That's what's going to sort of pull it all together. Okay. All right. I'm going to end the demo right here, and then I'll continue with this at the next class. Are there any questions before I finish up? No? Okay. Dive and have fun. Oh, on the other image right here, your light source is that light right here. You see it up on the wall? Unless you want to draw on another light. You can have that casting down on the truck. Or if you wanted to, you could pretend the inside of the warehouse is lit and lights coming out from there. You could do that as well. So you have two options there. Okay, but only those two. Don't have the light, the warehouse on and then the truck lights on and then a light on in the apartment in the back, then it gets to be too much. Okay, it's just stay simple right now. Okay? Alright, have fun.